Right, so now we are going to um, initiate a small interesting Mentimeter. We all hear about nature-based solutions in every context around the COP27 and every discussion. So we want to know about your viewpoint. So if you all can log into this Mentimeter code, we will take you through the questions. Thank you. Um, today, today, I would like to highlight some uh, of the success stories, challenges, and some calls to action. Uh, and we do that later in the, in the panel discussion. Um, well, about uh, what the three nature-based solution projects are, you will have three very nice videos during the program. But what is more exciting is what's coming up. We're starting and launching today our nature-based future challenge. Um, the previous challenge was six months, and you will see that this will take a lot longer time. Um, and it also has a, has a much larger scale of impact. Now, let's take a look at what the future challenge uh, on nature-based uh, looks like. Um, we will focus on a river delta. And why uh, are we focusing on a river delta? Um, obviously, because of uh, the, the climate effect uh, facing deltas, uh, but not, not only climate effects, also competing claims on land and water for food production, nature, infrastructure, energy, uh, and urban areas. So we need all the bright minds of our young people to come with the solutions for the future. Um, it is besides your normal program, so it's extracurricular. Um, we ask and we really need you to be multidisciplinary. So you will uh, end up working in teams uh, across uh, disciplines. It's open for bachelor and master students from all over the world. Um, we will arrange professional support in uh, not only thinking on the content, but also on the business-wise, on the impact-wise, and on the, on the policy. Um, you will hear from the two competitors here what an amazing journey it can be. Um, and in the end, it's not only about winning the money, of course, but it's about really making action and making impact on policymakers and uh, finances of uh, future programs. Um, we talk a lot about climate uh, change, but there's one other big challenge facing us, and that's biodiversity. So here we want to make a connection between climate change um, and biodiversity, and then also related to food security threats. Talked about why deltas are important, um, and that we really need new ways um, to make uh, our systems change. Well, what is it like? Um, from our, one of the previous challenges, we're not doing it all the time about nature-based solutions of, or deltas. Uh, rethink protein, for instance, in 2019. Uh, and competitors were really changed and overwhelmed by how much uh, their lives changed by competing uh, in this challenge. Um, for nature-based uh, futures, we envisage that you start with a long-term perspective. Here, an example of the country where I'm from, the Netherlands. Um, we looked ahead 100 years. What would a country, what would a delta look like in 100 years? And start from that image. Where do you want to go? What is the future? And what are the challenges we need to, uh, we need to solve by making use of nature-based solutions? Well, um, a bit about the differences at the Nature-Based so Solution Challenge, which the finalists are on, uh, on stage, except one, but Stefan will talk about, uh, also about the project in Brazil, uh, and the difference with the Nature-Based uh, Future Challenge. Um, the Solutions Challenge was much more focused on actual projects 
and nature-based solutions that solve a local problem. If you look to the future, we take an entire delta in, uh, in consideration and think of an entire delta. How could we change our systems and the way of we finance the future of our, our, of our delta? Um, and in the end, it's also about really making the impact and inspiring people um, to change their policy and financial schemes. Um, there are four criteria. If you compete, and we will ac assess all the, uh, uh, the solutions on four criteria. Biodiversity should have a positive result on biodiversity. Um, it should contribute to food security. Uh, and of course, enhance climate adaptability and resilience. And last but not least, we also think uh, on a monetary terms, it should deliver also positive social e economic impact. Um, today we launch our Delta, uh, our challenge, and the Delta we will reveal coming Saturday, also on COP27. Come back to that in, uh, in a bit. Um, register now so you're the first to know about updates. Uh, January 23 will start a series of three masterclasses preparing you and your teams um, to um, be ready to think about the future and uh, compete uh, against the other teams. And then in November 23, we will actually start working uh, in teams and designing our nature-based futures. Um, I said a bit about what we will do. Um, there will be a pre-selection. Uh, ten team teams will continue to the finals, uh, and they will get some extra workshops and online lectures and coaching by experts. Um, we'll organize a grand finale in Wageningen, the Netherlands. Um, yeah, and how much time does it cost? On average, our experience four to eight hours per week. And then we're talking about the, uh, the last part of it. So starting from uh, November 23. Okay, um, we're looking here for bachelor and master students, but also from partners. Partners who would like to support these, young, uh, these youngsters in designing the future-based um, uh, futures. So if you would like to contribute, contact our team in Wageningen, contact me after the session. Uh, and now it's time um, to go into what we learned in the past half year. I would like to invite uh, Stefan. Stephen, would you like to uh, take over the floor? Yes, uh, thank you so much, Ivo. Uh, I'm going to give a short introduction about Pura which is a group that took part in the NBS challenge, and Pura is from Brazil. Uh, it offered a training in agroecology systems, and the training was designed to be an end-to-end -end solution, providing participants uh, with an understanding of supply chains from the beginning to the end, that is seed collection to planting and management until commercialization. They also provided technical support to farmers to implement reference modules in different realities to serve and showcase for other farmers. Here is their video. We are here in São Francisco de Paula, Rio Grande do Sul, Brazil, in a territory called Campos de Cima da Serra, a physiographic region, mega geobiodiverse, an ecotone with forest and grassland ecosystems, a hotspot of biodiversity, in a region priority for conservation and restoration. For decades, the region has suffering from logging, pine, potato, and soybean monoculture. Every year, hundreds of thousands of hectares are used for these crops, leaving a legacy of environmental degradation and sociocultural impact. With this in mind, we are invested in restoration of this landscape with a combination of nature-based solutions, combining ecological restoration with regenerative agriculture aiming to transform it into a more resilient, adaptive and sustainable agroecosystem, while collaborating 
on projects with third parties. In the past months, we have offered a training in agroecological agroforestry systems with a special focus on social biodiversity products. At this training, we hosted 40 people, including family farmers, rural youth, researchers, rural technicians, people who work with social biodiversity products, and representatives of socially vulnerable groups. Present were people between 25 and 76 years old, generating a very diverse audience coming from 14 different regions. There were six days of workshops with more than 50 hours of classes divided into three modules. The first module focused on the introduction to agroforestry principles and fundamentals, thus providing participants with the ability to read the landscape and understand what actions to take to improve the environment, also implementing an agroforestry system from scratch. The second module focused on planning, so that participants could design their own systems. We also paid a special attention to management and enrichment of agroforestry systems, enabling the participants to practice that which is one of the biggest challenges of agroforestry. And the third module was about processing of socio-biodiversity products, markets and networks. In this module, participants were invited to actively participate in different methods of processing of native plants and learn about different uses of the same, focusing on aromatic and medicinal plants, native fruits and native timber. A great emphasis was given to further the understanding of how to participate in networks and how to strengthen them. The training was specifically designed in this way to ensure the maximum quality of learning and autonomy of trainees. We aim to demonstrate a complete understanding of the value chain involved in conservation and restoration of native vegetation. We demonstrate the enormity of commercial value potential available through engagement with socio-biodiversity products, which in turn generates a constant stream of income for those involved. Altogether, we worked with more than 110 different species of plants, among trees, bushes, herbs and annual crops. Uh, so, you just heard from uh, Team Pura, and now I'm going to introduce you to the next team, which I was part of. It, was, it is known as Bees for Hope, and this project uh, took place in eastern Uganda, in a landslide-prone district known as Bududa, and this community is close to a national park. Uh, the situation is that this community entirely depends on subsistence agriculture, but unfortunately they are not spared by climate change disasters. And whenever these climate change disasters occur, they are usually left with no options, but rather uh, exploiting or encroaching on the resources in the national park, cutting down trees, but also poaching game in the uh, protected area. So our intervention focused mainly on introducing an alternative source of livelihood. So we introduced beekeeping to these farmers, and this beekeeping uh, was done uh, within uh, the park buffer zones through collaborations uh, with different stakeholders, local NGOs, but also uh, the government agency responsible for protection of wildlife. Uh, we engaged over uh, 40 farmers and provided them with uh, initial beehives for installation. But we did not only do that, we also uh, went ahead to plant indigenous trees in the sections of the park that had already been degraded. Now the beehives were, were installed near the places that had already been uh, degraded. And the reason we did this was to ensure that the farmers become the stewards of the, pro of the prote protected area so that more encroachment doesn't happen. So this is the video for Bees for Hope. Welcome to Mount Elgon National Park, the project implementation area for Bees for Hope. To implement our nature-based solution, we started out by identifying stakeholders to work with. We successfully got Uganda Wildlife Authority, Africa 2000 Network, and local communities neighboring the park on board. 
The park is a biodiversity hotspot and yet surrounded by communities that have over time encroached on the landscape. Our aim in this landscape is to ensure that both nature and people flourish and also reduce the problem of landslides that come as a result of degrading the landscape. Together with our partners, we identified the most suitable alternative source of livelihood for the community, a nature-based solution to relieve the park of human pressure. Sites for hive installation were identified. We trained 60 farmers in good apiculture practices, hive installation, and the importance of tree planting. We installed 30 Kenyan top bar hives and planted albizia tree species in the degraded gaps of the national park Caliandra tree species as a bee foliage around the hives installed. We then met with the community groups to explain the scalability plan for the Apiculture Revolving Fund, drug group work plans, and a monitoring strategy for the Apiculture project. Our model establishes a potential of 10 new hives per season. Our model encourages farmers around Mount Elgon National Park to move from activities which degrade the national park like cultivation to solutions which respect nature that is beekeeping we do this by initially providing hives at no cost for installation once the honey is ready we buy it from the farmers as bees for hope a social enterprise add value and sell to final consumers creating a complete value chain for the honey business. When farmers are able to earn an income and have an alternative source of livelihood, it reduces their despair and encroachment on the park, helping in restoring the landscape and reducing the problem of landslides. This way, we are able to create a community where both people and nature thrive. We are currently writing grants and looking out for potential partners that will help us in mentorship but also get seed funding to officially establish Bees for Hope as a social enterprise. Right, so you saw two really amazing nature-based solution projects led by these teams. So I am part of School Meets the Reef team, which was um, actually a two-part project. One was coral reef rehabilitation, and the other was the education. And one of my colleagues is also in the, in the audience here with me. So it was a very nice project that we did in the eastern coast of Sri Lanka known as Kalkuda. Uh, where we went ahead and we uh, like uh, placed these coral reef walls and we are already seeing uh, the evidence of growth and you can see a little bit more about this through our vlog. <laughs> reefs on the east coast of Sri Lanka is considered as one of the most resilient reefs that we have and it's also one of the areas which provides a lot of benefits for the community including disaster risk reduction and also for the blue economy for fishing, ornamental fishing and tourism activities. Therefore, School Meets the Reef team, we decided that rehabilitating the coral reefs which has been depleted by fishing activities, bleaching and other anthropogenic stressors should be maintained and restored. So first of all what we did was a baseline study. The team uh, assessed uh, the levels of salinity and other parameters to see the feasibility of putting forward these coral nurseries. Then we started building the coral reef walls using recycled uh, concrete and a nursery using iron rods. On the 27th to 29th of July, we started to go into the site uh, to deploy these reef balls um, and it was not an easy task. We um, had to get the assistance from Earth Lanka volunteers, officers from Marine Environmental Protection Authority and also the fishermen from the community. Therefore, we went ahead and then we deployed the reef balls 500 meters away from the shoreline at a depth of 5 meters. Afterwards, uh, we gathered the coral fragments from the um, area itself 
which was Acropora corals and we started attaching them using underwater cement and also cable ties. Make a special underwater cement tag, make up your scarane, coral digger, attach caragan reef ball together. Make a salmon a big reef ball galola, vinadi suck with the gipama, fully tied vinava. We were also very fortunate to do a monitoring session one month after the outplanting and it was amazing to see that the corals have grown by about one to two millimeters with purple color tips. So I will take you through some of the key achievements of our project. Uh, so through the school program what we tried was to uh, train school children as change makers and also to spread the word on the importance of nature-based solutions in coastal conservation. The important thing about our project is that it's not just owned by one group, it's a more of a shared responsibility and also we pass down the responsibility especially to the youth in the area so in that way it will make it more sustainable and talking about the ability to replicate this model can be easily replicated Yeah, certainly a well-deserved uh, round of applause um, for the change makers, change makers on the stage and in the, the teams be behind uh, the IDs. Um, what we didn't mention is who won, did we? No. It was school meets the reef, indeed. Yeah. Um, I, will, I would go... Uh, into a panel discussion right now, but perhaps you in the audience already have some questions on the two videos. Um, unfortunately, we're not uh, so much set to answer all the questions from uh, the Brazil case. Um, but if you have questions, yes, please, the front row. A uh, mic's coming. Oh, sorry. After you, sir. Yeah. Yeah. And then I come to you. Hello, uh, thank you for the amazing project. It was really inspiring. I just have a question for you, Samantha and Samara. What were the problems you were facing as young people to achieve such great projects? Was it funding? Was it trust from the governments, the paperwork? What was the real problem and barriers you were facing? Yeah. First right. two? Uh, so one of the things, to be honest, in our perspective, um, it was very easy to get the support from the government authorities. Uh, but the problem was there is always a disagreement with who is involved in what. So there was an issue of like finding who is responsible for safeguarding coral reefs. So that was a bit of a difficult task. Uh, the second thing is like when it comes to short term projects, they are also not as well in interested to carry on forward. Uh, but, but to be honest, uh, in our project it was very easy, thankful to Earth Lank, I have to say, because the youth, the volunteers that were involved, engaged, you know, the people you saw in the video was amazing. Um, even Shamla is here from Earth Lanka. I have to give a big applause to her. Um, yeah, it was very easy for us, I would say, in that perspective. But yeah, there were some disconnections. How's it for you, Stefan? Uh, thank you, Ivo. Uh, for us, uh, we also didn't meet a lot of challenges, apart from uh, trying to establish partnerships. Sometimes there's a lot of bureaucracies, especially if you're trying to uh, work with an agency from the government, but even some NGOs. Uh, other than that, uh, nothing much. Good, thanks. Uh, another question from the audience. Sir, please also state your name. It's also nice to know. Uh, hello, my name is Aldushi Mahdi. I am a associated professor in Al Azhar University. Uh, I am a marine biologist. So already coral reef and mangrove is my working. So first of all, I would like to thank all the three projects straightforward. And I think it, the succeed come from because you do what you like. Everyone, he like what he do. So, and I think Jacques Cousteau, he's a famous scientist from France, says that the man protect what he love. So that's very good. But my questions for you about the coral reef, 
uh, we already in the Red Sea here in uh, Horgada, we did rehabilitation by a sexual reproduction. We call it, this is a sexual reproduction. Sometimes we have a problem facing the uh, turbidity, uh, sometimes high temperature and bleaching, especially when we do the rehabilitation, we already do a lot of sedimentation. So how you keep very well with that? And uh, now we were looking for to do sexual reproduction. Do you know anything? And you can help me to just give me some things from your idea. Again, I would like to clap for him. Please accept me. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the question. So yes, it is a very difficult task when it comes to rehabilitating corals. So the part that we chose to rehabilitate is a resilient reef, uh, first of all, I have to say that. So it gives us the opportunity to work with uh, rehabilitation in the first place, but also there are these seasonal changes. So after we planted the corals in July, we have already done three monitoring sessions during the season, and we could see growth but now we are moving towards the off season. So to be honest, <laughs> we have to wait till like around next June to see what will happen. But we are hoping it wouldn't be too, uh, too like lot of damages because from the service that I have done in the past, what we saw was this reef keep on growing. So hopefully, we are really hopeful that by June it will work out. But um, in terms of sexual reproduction based ones, so, um, it's a very, I think it's a very expensive uh, kind of approach. I know in Florida Keys, this is one of the biggest like micro-fragmenting and uh, yeah, that's a very big uh, part of uh, work that's going on. In Sri Lanka at the moment, uh, we are always doing asexual reproduction based projects, in situ and ex situ. So I would like to have a laboratory in one of the places, but at the moment we don't have, yeah, thanks. Yeah, one more, that's okay. One. Uh, also for biodiversity, it's not good to rehabilitate one species. When we only rehabilitate acrobora, so as you know, biodiversity means different species in different areas, fauna and flora. So how we can also enhance the environment to rehabilitate more one species, maybe acrobora, fungia, platigera, and so on. Thank you. Well, that's a food for thought and discussion onwards. Thank you, sir. For yeah, we certainly, yeah, terrific. And start a project here as well, yeah. Yeah, nice. Um, any other questions from the audience? Yes, please, and state your name. Thank you. Hi, my name is Mark Haver, and I feel so inspired by the projects that you guys have led in your communities. I think it's incredible to think about sort of how these are not just frontline communities, but the way that you're able to inspire something that may not have existed in your communities without you is something that also shows me how far we in the developed world have to go to inspire local conservation and restoration efforts. Something that I think is so wonderful about your projects is the inspiration that you cause. And if we had more of people just like you, I think we would be able to do so much more. So I feel like my question for you guys is how can we inspire and scale projects like yours to really be able to make sure that the nature-based solution projects that we're creating are not in isolation, but are more and more every year, every day? Yeah, great question. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Stephen, what's your answer? Yeah, so uh, I think one of the ways we can uh, support more young people to take such uh, initiatives is uh, to have more trust in them, especially when it comes to the level of governments. I am from uh, a government which doesn't trust young people so much because there is this narrative that the young people don't have the experience uh, to manage projects and all that. So I think uh, these projects should be uh, an inspiration for governments to see that indeed young people can make a change in their communities and we need to trust them with the resources, we need to build their capacity to see the change that they are driving get scaled up. Thank you. Yeah, nice. And Samara, how is that for you? What are you doing in continuing the interventions and scaling up? 
Yes, uh, I would like to say that we are very, very appreciative of Wageningen University. They even extended the funding for us to continue working on the project. So as I mentioned earlier, now we are reaching the off season. So we are going to do the school-based uh, programs first. So we are going to target areas in like other coastal areas, focus on how education can actually bring uh, the young generation to understand the importance of coastal ecosystems because although they live like few kilometers uh, from the ocean, they're very, like they're not at all understanding about what's going on, you know, in their own environment. So yeah, we want to carry forward this and uh, yeah, and also another thing that we are aiming to do is introduce this into the curriculum. Because in our curriculum, we don't talk about uh, nature-based solutions unless you go to the geography stream or like biology stream, but what about the rest of the other streams, right? So that's one of the things that we are aiming to do in the future, yeah. Yeah, that's a nice uh, call to action as well. Uh, Stephen, a call to action from you was uh, gaining of or radiating more trust, uh, what else could other people around you and around the world do to enhance youth in stepping up and making more game changes? Uh, I think uh, we need to, first of all, understand that uh, we don't have the luxury of uh, implementing partial solutions. So, uh, we need to look at holistic solutions that uh, work for both people and nature. And we can't go wrong with nature-based solutions. And we know that young people are very innovative. So what I would say is that uh, we need more investment in them, capacity building, to see that uh, what they do, they can scale it up. Yeah. yeah. Thank you very much. Um, and with that, I would like to almost conclude, except if there is another question from the audience, there is still room for one. Yes, I see one. Can the mic go over there? Yeah, hello, I'm Thomas Westhoff uh, from EIS. Uh, and I was wondering, uh, you have had several trainings, right, as part of this, uh, this program. Uh, so I was wondering, can you tell a bit about that and how this has helped you in bringing your uh, projects further? Excellent question. Stephen, to start? Yeah, uh, we've had uh, a number of uh, trainings, including uh, project management. Uh, of course, this helped us in uh, setting our goals, objectives, and making sure that uh, whenever we are working, Indeed, we are working towards a target. We had other uh, aspects also trained, like making vlogs, which are very important if you're going to tell your story, like we've just done. So we feel uh, uh, that has empowered us a lot when it comes to communicating what we are doing and seeking for further support. Thank you. And uh, last word, Samara. Uh, yes, I have to uh, always thankful to our mentor Cass uh, from Arcades. He was there every step of the way, uh, helping us, guiding us, correcting things, and also like even after this challenge, he's there to help us with Arcades. Um, you know, in uh, following up with the project, and also I we had several workshops also with uh, with Owen Bees and uh, also from Wageningen on how to make a vlog. So it was very, very interesting. Yeah, I'm very thankful to them. Well, we should be grateful for you for being an inspiration, the both of you and the, all the other competitors and participants uh, for us, uh, for our friends over the world. And as you say, Samara, uh, I've seen a lot of people involved in helping you also get inspired by you. And I think that's a, a very good thing to, uh, to take forward. Um, I would like to ask you to have one word uh, and note that down in our Mentimeter. Um, guys from the Mentimeter, can we have the last question on the slide? May I invite you to enter one word which you will remember from this session? Oh, we had this one as well. Uh, but we skip this for now. We do the other one. 
Yes, one word. Uh, and with that, I think it's time for a round of uh, final applause, thanking for you being here, and thanks for you.